is Aaron Winnick, and I am the associate editor of the Future of Work for MIT Technology Review. And today I'm going to welcome up our three panelists to the stage. You guys can come on up. Um, we have uh, Daria Gutnick, the founder and CEO of Bunch.ai, which matches candidates to job postings based on their mindset and their resumes. We have Carl Alomar, who is the COO of DigitalOcean, which is a cloud platform on which applications such as AI and machine learning programs are built. And we have Dennis Mortensen, founder and CEO of X.ai, an AI-based software that assists you with scheduling meetings. So today we're going to talk a little bit about AI and automation as a whole and how that is shaping the workplace of the future. And so to kick things off, um, I wanted to start with Daria down on the end. And since we're going to be focusing on AI and machine learning, I wanted to get your definition of what both of these words really mean, because I think we see a lot of press releases and things that just have them plastered all over it without really knowing what's behind it. So I want to actually, um, first of all, thank you so much for, for being here today, and thank you so much for giving the opportunity to be here. Um, I want to refer to it as machine learning just for simplicity and um, understanding reasons. I know these both terms are being um, used interchangeably, and I think it's totally okay to actually kind of um, get a more mainstream understanding of it. Um, so I won't go into the details on like what the AI machine learning difference is. But what I understand, at least under machine learning, is if we actually train computers to do things that humans do um, in maybe a faster and more scalable way, and over time these systems autonomously become better at these tasks by feeding um, interaction and more data and feedback and input into um, the training, then that's what I would say machine learning is. You hear me better now? Okay. <laughs> um, okay, and then just to kind of build on the, the hype idea, Carl, do you think a lot of the hype around AI is justified? And do you think that it really is a different technology than some of the other you know, workplace transformation technologies that we've seen in the past? Um, yeah, again, same as Dar. I'd like to thank you for uh, inviting us to be here. And thanks for everyone for, for being here as well. Um, <coughs> I definitely do. I, in the business that we're in, we really empower and facilitate young businesses to build uh, their infrastructure and their technologies. And so what we see a lot is um, you know, the challenges that young businesses have when they're competing with larger, larger companies and are trying to compete with a very lean team against organizations that have big, big resources. Technologies like AI, the ability to actually uh, analyze the market and understand what you're going into and make decisions in a more efficient and more effective way allows them to compete. And without that, you know, you're, you're really kind of fighting dollar for dollar, but it's the innovations in AI, innovations in machine learning that allow you to do a lot more with a lot less resource. And I think that's the power that it provides and the, ch the, uh, the opportunity it provides for new businesses as they grow. That's why we see so many companies really trying to build machine learning as the kind of fundamental basis of, of how they're building their technologies. Great. And then Dennis, I'd love to kick this off with you, but actually go through and have all of you answer this, which is how have you seen AI already changing businesses that you guys are working with? And then how do you see it changing businesses in five years down the road? So we do something that suddenly on kind of first look sounds kind of simple, as in how complex can it be to get two people together next Wednesday at one o'clock at 200 Broadway and how much AI you really need to kind of make that happen. Am I on? No. Here. There you go. You're good. Yeah. We're good? Why the fuck would you give me a microphone that's not on? <laughs> Reset. <laughs> so uh, I, I think suddenly it might just, on first look, sound like this whole idea of getting some intelligent <laughs> agent to arrange a meeting between two participants come next Wednesday at one o'clock would be something that we would have solved 20 some odd years ago. But certainly what excites me about this kind of very moment in time, uh, exactly, I'm getting older, I have some sort of memory of taking my CS degree on the command line and things have certainly changed over the last uh, 25 years. But I think there's two things that are about to Use this one and just check that. Am I still not on? You said yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, now it's good, right? No. no. So this one, this one is on. Are we good? Yeah. 
you're going to get a four in my NPS survey. Um, I, I think there's two things, certainly, that kind of excites me about what we might just describe as the future of work. And not necessarily just the AI moniker, but there's this whole new software paradigm that we might just uh, describe as the conversational UI that's about to happen, right? As in, we haven't really seen that many new UIs over the last kind of four or five decades, and it doesn't really matter how you kind of slice and dice it. I think perhaps there's been three or four, but it seems almost kind of inevitable that we'll be talking to our computers in the not too distant future. And when that happens, and it doesn't matter whether that is that kind of odd way we are working with our Alexa device today and that kind of half query we're doing on Siri, but there's some movement towards that. But once we arrive and natural language becomes the kind of primary input to compute, I think there's this opportunity to move from work that is very kind of task focused. So if I want to build a model for how I think my business should perform in 2019, I'll jump into Excel and I'll sit with my VP of Finance and we will do all the work. And it's really not something for where I think in objectives, I think in tiny tasks. I think in this new kind of paradigm, you can start to think in objectives. So our little agent, however kind of tiny it might be, is actually an agent for where you describe some job you want done. Hey, Amy, which is the agent, or Andrew, can you get me, Suzanne, and John together at the office first week of February for half an hour, please? That's multiple tasks, but I know what I want. You then do what I want, and that, I think, is going to be a major paradigm shift. And it's not just to set up meetings. You can immediately kind of imagine 15 other little chores that you have to do every day that you'd rather not do, and I think they're just about to happen. This is the good one. All right, we got the good mic. <laughs> um, I think I've got similar 25-year background before I, you know, I did my uh, electrical electronic engineering degree, but um, I think having been in the industry as long as we have, you see a lot of different phases of technology development. And in each phase, in each stage of that development, there is a disruptive technology that is changing the way in which people work and changing the way in which people company, in which companies grow. I think the current one really is oriented towards AI and ML. A lot of it is driven by compute technologies that are now capable of, of processing mass data and creating intelligence that we just didn't have the computing power to do before. I think when you ask the question about what it's going to look like in five years, technologies will continue to evolve and new disruptive technologies will begin to take that leading path. But right now, uh, I think AI ML is taking a position where the adoption of it is giving early adopters an advantage. Uh, over time, it will become standardly adopted across all businesses. And then at that point, the next disruptive technology will come. The big difference that we see in the businesses that are adopting it is in each stage of technical development over the last 25 years, people have been narrowing down their focus on who they're servicing. Um, 25 years ago, you were servicing a country or a multi-million person audience and you were trying to figure out who these people are based upon surveys and uh, you know a lot of kind of open data in the marketplace. And it's getting closer and closer to the point where we're actually servicing an individual. So your example is a great example where you're providing a very key service to an individual. And what AI and ML do is they allow you to understand and learn that individual's traits, compare that individual's traits to everybody else on the platform, and customize the experience specifically to that individual. So I'd say over the next five years, we'll, are you going to take the risk? <laughs> we will, uh, let's hope that MPS goes to five, not three. <laughs> but we will, um, I think what will happen is you're going to start seeing more and more customized uh, individual experiences over the next five years as these technologies really, really begin to understand and learn more about the person that they're serving. So moving to IoT, moving to AI, AI ML, delivering that experience directly into your hands as close as it can be to you, that's really where the current revolution of technology is, is, uh, is moving. And, uh, and I'm excited to see that evolve and I'm excited to see what comes off of the back of that and what the next revolutionary uh, technology looks like as well. I want to build on top of uh, what was just said by Dennis and Carl, and I think um, want to answer this question from a personal standpoint of view, like what excites me about the future that we're building um, is that 
imagine you have the chores automated and you don't actually need to deal with the tedious tasks. And all of us have them every day from scheduling um, calendar invites and, and appointments to actually answering emails that could be easily answered in a very quick and automated way and so on and so on. What do we do with that free time? I think is the m most interesting question. So we definitely will end up with much more time because the progress we see with technologies like behind x.ai but also behind bunch.ai um, is actually quite fast and faster than we may have expected. So for simple tasks and chores, it is very easy to actually get the machine learning job done quickly. So we will see more and more of that automation happen. And I think what we need to answer to ourselves is which impact do we want to have on the future of this world and what do we want to do with that time that is actually left over. And I deeply believe that it requires more human intelligence than less to be able to conquer that future because it actually is not as simple anymore as just to get a job and then perform tedious tasks and make a living. But you actually really need to figure out how can you contribute to actually building a future worth living and deploy problem solving skills, deploy creativity and not only on some minority, some small group of people level um, that are called leaders, but actually on a more democ like democratic level where each and one of us is going to be answering that question now that I don't have a purpose to actually perform some tedious task and that's going to give me the job. What can I do? And I think this is a really interesting, very challenging, and very exciting at the same time future that we're building. Cool. And I'll mention one more time because I don't think my mic was on last time. If you want to ask any questions, feel free to send them through the app. And um, if we don't get any, I'll keep going with questions, but um, please feel free to send those in. Um, so, you know, this is a, a big transformation. This what you guys are talking about, what this future might have in store, but there are still some hurdles to overcome and some difficulties with working with AI, such as trying to find data and trying to overcome bias and things like that. What are some of the ways that you guys have tried to overcome these big issues? And do you have any advice to people that might be trying to deploy it in their businesses to try to overcome these? Whoever wants to take it, feel free. So, so I can start with some of the challenges that we've had. So I, uh, is this on? <laughs> well, that's a three now. I'm just, <laughs> 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 just stick with this one. We'll just so go with, we'll see. <laughs> here, I'll take it. Okay. Um, okay. Gonna put it down here. <laughs> Am I on? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> no, don't come up here. <laughs> <laughs> I promise we want to hear what you're saying, so. <laughs> this is a conspiracy. I like it. <laughs> Dennis, you should come up to Midtown yeah. and uh, we'll laugh at you. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. So, uh, so I'll talk about some of the, the challenges that we've certainly had, and I don't think they're unique. I think anybody really at this very moment in time will have very similar challenges. So I personally uh, had this kind of very naive idea that as soon as you move away from prior paradigms where you would need some sort of education to use any application, we might just have used so many applications in the past that we can quickly pick it up. As in, you don't need to be a Photoshop expert to start using Photoshop. I can probably figure out how to crop an image. I might need more education to kind of take full advantage of that piece of software. But I actually thought when we moved into some setting for where all you need is natural language, you would be immediately educated. As in, if you can just kind of speak uh, even Danish English, like me, with uh, shitty grammar, and the machine can kind of figure that out, then you don't need any kind of upfront idea of how to kind of interact with this agent. And that was just uh, not true. And it was uh, so not true that we were certainly, in the beginning, kind of extremely confused about why would people not just take this on and speak to the machine like they would have spoken to one of their colleagues? And I'll give you just one example here. So in perhaps no more than two and a half years ago, so we've been at it for the last four and a half years, the most um, asked question, if I looked at the tickets in our kind of traditional kind of support system, was how do you stop uh, Amy from kind of working on a meeting. Say that somehow uh, you're coming in late, we don't need the meeting, uh, I'm having it rescheduled, but he just called me, so the whole thing is kind of done and dusted. And then we'll email into support and say, how do I ask Amy to stop a meeting? And I'm thinking, how about you say that? Amy, please stop the meeting. As in, wh what was it for where you thought, I'll spend my time writing support, instead of taking those four words and just write that to the agent, making the assumption that the agent will understand it. But that was just, not obvious. So I think one of the obstacles here is perhaps 
suddenly on the kind of kind of R and D end, still kind of quite massive because whenever you want a machine to kind of communicate with a human, there's all sorts of ambiguity that come comes attached to that. But education is really something that we spent an unfair amount on in the last, I would say, couple of years. How do I best make sure people understand what we have to offer? Once they understand that, how do I best make sure that we onboard them to the extent where they can do that first meeting? Once they've done that first meeting, how do I make sure they can do the next kind of 13? And that have been a really kind of steep learning curve, both for us and for the users. And you know, go no further. Look at my wife when she looks uh, to kind of ask uh, Alexa for the weather. I'm not sure who sounds the most robotic in that kind of uh, setting. Because first of all, she's at volume eight, and I'm thinking, why do you think my Alexa device is deaf? You can just, uh, just tone it, tone it the fuck down. Just as in, I was sleeping, but now you're screaming to Alexa about how the weather is. And why are you using kind of some sort of new Russian accent? You also Danish. What what happened uh, in this? And again, it might just be, you know, fun to kind of have a laugh at, but somehow she decided that that was the right thing to do. And uh, sure, you know, she's uh, in the food industry and uh, good for her, uh, but somehow she couldn't kind of take that step and just immediately kind of think, oh, this would be like having hired somebody that's got 13 skills and whenever I want to invoke any one of those 13 skills, I can just kind of ask in the most kind of natural way, but that has been uh, suddenly challenging. Don't. Sorry, this turned into kind of a uh, <laughs> <laughs> therapy session for Dennis. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I think from uh, DigitalOcean's point of view, I I'll kind of answer this question as it relates to um, what I said earlier, which is trying to customize the experience for our individual customers. So one of our biggest challenges is, you know, how do we help our customers be successful in building whatever they're building, understanding what they're doing? And I think the biggest challenge in that, we, we have a great sample set, you know, we got million and a half uh, uh, accounts building platforms on top of DigitalOcean. And uh, as a result, we really understand a whole slew of different applications and the way people use infrastructure and, and kind of it teaches us a lot in terms of what they're trying to build and how they're trying to build and how we can be helpful to guide them in that process. The problem I think exists um, when you start thinking about the, you know, the data protection and the confidentiality and our, and our uh, kind of, um, guideline of saying we do not want to enter into their environment it's their environment that's not for us to see and so how do we actually understand and use the peripheral information to give us a understanding of the individual customer so that we can actually really support and help that individual customer without piercing that veil of confidentiality that the individual needs and so um, a lot of things happening with GDPR and, and uh, a lot of data protection activities around the world that's really trying to protect people in this world where everyone's data can be used to kind of measure them and test them, something we talked about earlier. Um, and so how do you build a business that's really there to help the individual but not break that trust? And I think that's probably the biggest challenge in terms of getting data that you can use but without you know, using the data that makes people feel uncomfortable about uh, how much you know about them. And so I think that's a really difficult balance um, that we have to play with to, to be able to provide the best service possible for the individual. Yeah. I want to build on top of that. Yeah, exactly. Do you hear me? <laughs> Change. <laughs> 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 <I'll take it. laughs> um, so, who of you is actually working on some like machine learning projects or somehow involved in it, or is it? No. Okay. Good to know. Um, so, I think we had the same issue. Obviously, we had the same challenge. Like, how do we help each of you understand that we're coming in peace and like whatever data <laughs> you're giving us, <laughs> we are actually using to provide value to you instead of someone else um, or the AI army or whoever. And I think the, if we look at other technologies um, or what helped us is actually to figure out and look at other technologies that or concepts, business models that didn't exist before and actually were fighting for adoption. So if you remember um, before Uber and Airbnb, like the year 2006, I believe, was like before iPhone and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, each of one of these concepts had to fight for acceptance and adoption. And Airbnb made a really great piece and I think multiple um, talks on the topic of designing for trust 
And I think our, so speaking from a personal perspective and from a startup's founder perspective, I think we realized too late or uh, prioritized a bit too low how big the task of every machine learning based product is to actually design for trust and start with that design paradigm of we are, yes, we're a data company. Yes, we're an engineering company. Yes, we're so nerdy and yes, we're so cool. And we can solve this problem. But in the end, it's all worth nothing. If you don't trust it, you don't understand it, it doesn't deliver value to you. And I think um, being just one and a half years old, um, we switched about, I would say, like seven to eight months into the project like totally away from start like kind of only focusing on improving the predictions improving the recommendations building in feedback and so on to actually hiring um, a much more experienced designer bringing in advisors on the team and actually help out to figure out how to get that message across that you guys can actually trust the technology and it can provide value to you and I think this was um, speaking to other machine learning companies I, I realized that this is still not a uh, well understood or solved challenge. Yeah. And before you pass off the microphone, we have an audience question that kind of builds on that. How long do you think it will take for trust and privacy issues to like catch up to this? What do you think the time frame is, or do you think it will always be lagging behind kind of where the technology is at? Ah, interesting. So our company is actually based in Berlin, and we have um, European and American clients. So. We are at in the center of the battlefield, I would say. <laughs> um, so we are GDPR compliant because we have to be legally. Um, and I think it's a very interesting question because it, so from, from our perspective, it definitely does slow down the technology development to a certain degree. Like if I compare the European ecosystems with the American ecosystems and like how fast we can make progress on where, I'm gonna, where are we gonna get data from? Let's just take it from here. Oh no, that's not GDPR compliant. Shit, can't do it. Let's find another. So we have to go from multiple rounds of like finding creative solutions around the challenges to adhere to the legal guidelines. Um, I think though, it depends on the policies. Um, and I'm not sure I can really make a claim at this point because I don't think GDPR has really landed yet. So we all spend a lot of hours and, and legal fees on making sure that our documentation is in order and you can read everything in the data declaration. However, what does that really mean in terms of lived policies, like practice, business practice? And I constantly talk to other entrepreneurs about this and I don't think anyone, like there is a funny quote going around I think and it's kind of like everyone is GDPR compliant but nobody knows what that means <laughs> yep. so can't really tell I hope um, there is a movement in Europe where European tech entrepreneurs are kind of like uniting in a way and actually writing like open letters to the EU constantly about different topics it's getting picked up so there seems to be a dialogue that's being established however I don't know how successful that will be so we have Got it. All right, we have another audience question I'll give to you, which is, are there any jobs that you think won't be affected by AI? And I'll broaden that out to job categories as well. So you can always split the world into uh, two different buckets, but I think it's certainly fair to suggest that it's unlikely that we'll see full-on jobs disappear in the near future as in I just can't imagine any job fully replaced by AI that doesn't suggest that there's chores or tasks within certain job functions that will be automated but I think there might just be a first wave that will be way more positive than negative and I think the smallest of tests that you can do here is go find that uh, initial job posting that you looked at when you took on that job and uh, they would have some set of words and a set of bullets that suggested what they wanted you to do. If you go look at those seven bullets, if you're in customer success or account management or sales or engineering or what have you, then go look at your inbox. See how many of those emails you can pair to those seven bullets. Because I think what you'll find is that, hey, half my job is other shit I have to do to do what they really hired me to do. So if you're an account manager, really, certainly if you work for me, I would love for you to spend most of your time with our clients. I said, that's what I hired you to do, not to sit and fiddle with whether you can talk next Wednesday or have some $4 bagel reimbursed or whatever that might be. So I think this kind of first wave is certainly one where you'll see very few jobs fully disappear and a lot of chores disappearing so we can finally start to do what we were hired to do. So that's the kind of optim optimist in me and suddenly kind of the immediate utopia that I can kind of imagine. But then I also think it's fair to kind of do another kind of split 
which is that there's certain technologies that are certainly speaking to existing jobs being done by humans. And then there's other technologies that will just democratize access to something that used to be a luxury. And if we take our technology as an example here, it's not like uh, I had a human assistant, right? As in, anybody in here has got a human assistant full time? So you won, two people won the corporate lottery, right? So for the rest of us, poor people, we are really just on our own, right? So it's not like we lost a human assistant to this one particular task. It's just that we couldn't really afford it. And when we couldn't afford it, we would just sit at 11 p.m. in our underwear at home trying to kind of manage our schedule. And that, I think, is going to be an interesting bucket for where there are going to be a lot of technology that we're going to get access to that we'd otherwise not have been able to get our hands on. And um, I, I'll add to Is this working now? Yeah. All right. Woo. I can see the green lights on. Um, I'll add one thing to that. I mean, if you just look at history, I've always been uh, a big study of history to kind of show the trends of how things are happening. And automation isn't new. Automation started at the beginning of the 20th century when they started creating manufacturing lines for, for cars. And so, um, or even before that possibly. But the idea of automation killing jobs has never been real. What it does is it changes the work environment. Um, I mean, today we have a significant amount more um, people in the workforce than we had 100 years ago, and yet our employment rate is way lower than it was 100 years ago, unemployment rate rather. So that just speaks to the fact that there's a, you know, as the world changes, as the world evolves, the responsibilities and the tasks that we have to face and we have to execute on change. I think it does become more efficient because you take a lot of the noise away. Uh, but there are aspects of human creativity, there are aspects of human relationships that to some degree AI can step in and help with, but in a lot of ways still requires a real human touch. And I don't think that'll change. Go ahead. Can I just under, because that is my primary argument, the one that you just made, because I think it's almost lazy when people suggest that in the next set number of years, tens of millions of Americans will be unemployed, because that is the easiest thing to imagine. It takes no energy. It takes a little bit more energy to then imagine. So if these jobs change, what new ones might arrive? As in, that takes some effort. As in, I'm not sure I could even come up with the fact that two million people would be employed in the app economy 15 years ago. As in, what does that even mean 15 years ago, right? So I think it's somewhat lazy. and I th really want to underline the fact that if you are betting on these tens of millions of Americans being unemployed, you're also betting on the fact that we somehow lost our creativity or our lust for more. And I'm just not seeing that. If anything, the more technology we have, it certainly looks like the more lust we've been able to assemble. I'd, I'd then ask real quick too, how do you think those people that will be moving from those jobs will be able to adapt to some of these newer jobs? Is there training that you think that needs to be brought about? So there's always the kind of counter argument that people immediately kind of push back to a happy kid like me for where, hey, Dennis, I'm just see not seeing any one of those truck drivers doing Python in the next 18 months. Yeah, I get it. That, I think, is equally kind of lazy. And if that is your best argument, then I'm not sure we have much to kind of uh, debate. Because if I look at um, that particular truck driver, so all my grocery arrives from, I assume, Long Island somewhere, and it comes into Manhattan, and if someday that car doesn't need that driver, I don't think I've lost my kind of creativity for other things I want from Fresh Direct. Don't leave it in the lobby. How about you bring it up to the 19th floor? Don't leave it on the 19th floor. Bring it into my kitchen. Don't leave it in the kitchen. Please unpack it, put it into my fridge. Don't put it into my fridge. Please cut my uh, oranges out in little bits. And I was saying, uh, you know, step seven is feed me. But, you know, whatever comes in between uh, here and before you kind of feed me, as in, those are just, you know, silly ideas, right? But as in, there's so much more I could ask from Fresh Direct. And this is just the entrepreneurial mind, right? I'm sure they could do 15 ideas that are much, much stronger. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about getting from Long Island to Manhattan. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I'm going to challenge both of you. And I was very impatient sitting here because I think there is... I personally don't like to lead this discussion this way because I, ag I agree with you in a general terms. Like I'm also seeing the bright picture in the future, but I think arguing this way is not going to help us. And the reason why I think it's not going to help us is because we need to understand that we will not have these jobs. I think that's a very clear starting point. 
these truck drivers will not have that job. And I think, Aaron, like I read your, your blog post about your, your first um, employment, and I think it's very clear, and I really recommend reading her work anyways, but like there's a really good story around like, there is thousands, millions, and billions of jobs have been already replaced in um, industries that we never even talk about because they're blue collar, like auto um, automotive industry in Germany is completely automated. Like so many people lost their jobs over the past years. And it's not a, this is like a fantasy or we don't want to hear it kind of thing. That just happens and it's part of the process. And so in order to be able, like with any other challenge that comes towards our society and, and our businesses, we just need to face it and actually ask ourselves, all right, what then? Like, so if he's not gonna do Python, what can this person then do? And I think the skill to upskill or like the ability to make products accessible so that it requires more like less expert knowledge to operate them. And I think this is where we actually as tech entrepreneurs can take responsibility. And oftentimes we have this discussion internally where we're fighting for product market fit. Let's just build it. Who cares whether it's accessible? No one needs to see the different colors. No one needs to see the buttons and whatever. Like let's not care about it, but it's, we can't think this way anymore. I think we need to really think um, about the systematic implications of what we're doing. And I agree with pushing technology forward. However, I do think that we need to bring that aspect back of, so if we are changing this one thing, what other things are going to be changed and how can we help to kind of transition smooth in that yeah. chain? So I think that's a fair comment. And I do think that uh, training and, and developing people over time, as a lot of companies do in real time, is very valuable. However, I would argue that um, not only is the technology changing, but so is the workforce. So every year, a significant number of people leave the workforce and a significant number of new people enter the workforce. And the new people entering the workforce are trained in a very different way to the people leaving the workforce. And so even though there is that transitional set that are actively in the workforce in a job that is going to evolve and they need to be trained and moved, over time that is a depleting concern because over time those people are no longer in the workforce the people that working manufacturing lines in the 40s and 50s are not in the workforce today so we don't need to retrain them however all of the people that came through engineering and cs degrees from the 90s through to now are all that's 25 30 years worth of of people entering the workforce are all well set up for the you know the evolution of technology into the future so I agree with you that there has to, we have to be supportive of helping people transition as technology transitions, but we also have to recognize that the workforce itself is changing, the world is evolving. Uh, it's a very, very different set of skills that people have today than, than, than they had 100 years ago. And that's why the unemployment rate is so low today, because it's servicing that skill set. And just to reference, in case you want to look at what she was talking about, it's an article I wrote about um, when I had to automate someone's job as a college uh, intern called Confessions of an Accidental Job Destroyer. So, um, yes. <laughs> but um, I think we're almost out of time, so I'm going to end on one last question, which is, do you guys have any advice for people in the audience if they're looking at deploying AI in their businesses, the first place they should look and or things that they should be wary of? I'm gonna go quick, um, but hopefully spot on. Um, I am really inspired by one woman's work. Uh, her name is Cassie Kaiserkov. She's the Chief Decision Intelligence Officer at Google, um, Google Cloud or whatever. Um, but the big deal about her is not that she's at Google, but actually how well she can explain and understand the new world of like the technology that we're all talking about and the automation. Really recommend reading her work. Uh, she writes really good articles about what machine learning is, how to actually start out machine learning projects, what they mean, and so on and so on. And I think the biggest takeaway for me from her work was um, you really need to understand how to empower decision makers to actually have all the data they need to make good decisions around it. So I think this is the biggest kind of like bigger future topic is to make sure that we all have enough education about like to understand what's actually happening and to make the best decision possible. Yeah, I'd say one of the most powerful organizations, um, uh, teams that I built at DigitalOcean as we were evolving was the data science and engineering team. And I, my key message would be if you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to build something that really orients around understanding data, AI, ML, all those things, look for that, those skill sets early because they will provide you with the creativity you need to really understand um, exactly how you can uh, uh, apply data into the way that you're thinking about your business. So I feel as though that is a, a key burgeoning um, skill set that, that I'm seeing as an incredibly valuable skill set to any business that's kind of establishing itself and figuring out how to build. So there's certainly going to be a 
massive set of predictions done in the back end that will automate a whole host of things that we just had processes put in place for before. So that is more difficult to kind of touch. If you then also accept that on the front end, the kind of conversational UI or the idea of the intelligent agent arriving in the workplace is inevitable. I would almost, if you run some organization or some business unit or some team, try to figure out how can I expose my team to that. And you can run all sorts of experiments, right? And it could be the simplest of experiments. If you run a team of 40, how about you buy them all an Alexa device? Or how about you force them all to do 150 queries on Siri the next coming month? Because there'll be some version of where they'll have to do this in the future, or at least being able to converse with machines. And instead of that being kind of some rude awakening some morning in 2021, perhaps there's some experiment that you can run. Or if you want something really tangible, because I am an entrepreneur, immediately go to X.AI, sign up, and uh, speak to Amy and Andrew. Cheers. All right, and with that, can we give a big round of applause to our panelists? Thank you so much. And I think we might have some lunch waiting for you guys. So thank you guys. Have a good rest of your day.